I am delighted to be joined by Stephen McRae, a principal dancer of the Royal Ballet. He's been called a modern day Fred Astaire for his tap dancing talents. He's known for his speed, his red hair and for originating roles such as the Mad Hatter and the Creature in Frankenstein. Multi award winning, including Young Australian Achiever of the Year. He's reached the dizziest of heights in his ballet career and experienced injuries that have been crushing lows. This is a man I admire for his resilience in the face of adversity, his belief that anything is possible, and his dedication to do the work it takes to achieve what he wants. Welcome, Stephen. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm so pleased that you're here, honestly. And um, uh, I've I followed your journey on social media and it is uh, just such uh, an inspiration. So we're going to talk about you today. I want to know all the secrets, all all the things, your philosophy, all of that, how, how you've done it, how you keep going, et cetera, et cetera. But first of all, tell us where it all began, because I believe that you are the son of a drag yeah, racer. Yeah, so it's not the, I guess traditional introduction to the world of arts that people would probably expect. I think many people have preconceived ideas of those that are involved in the world of arts, where they've come from. Um, I most certainly, well, probably are from the complete other end of the, <laughs> of the spectrum there. So I grew up in a motorsport family. My father uh, was a drag racer. He's an auto electrician by trade. And my mother and father, uh, you know, raced for years and years and years most of their friends were met at the racetrack they even had their honeymoon at the racetrack so my sister and i were brought up surrounded by cars um in america of course there's you know big sponsorship and it's a full-time profession in australia it was very much you know a hobby for him he was an auto electrician as i said by trade so i uh, grew up seeing and witnessing for myself at a young age my father, who was obviously passionate about his family and supporting his family, but had this passion that he also pursued and brought us along with him, you know, to experience that passion. And I think to see your father doing that, it, it had such an impact on me without even, you know, me realizing at such a young age. But I loved it. My sister and I were at the racetrack most weekends. Um, hanging out, obviously, with my my parents, and you know, we had family friends that helped with the car and all that. And my dad was just one of those people that would find solutions to everything, and he still is that way. You know, he couldn't afford to import the best equipment from the United States and things like that to compete with these top cars. So, if he needed a new part for the engine or whatever, he made it himself. You know, he made things with his bare hands and just made do. And okay. I need to try and achieve this and I can't do it the usual route. So I'll find a way to try and do it. And again, I now know as an adult, what an impact that had on me. It was always that, okay, find a solution. You know, not everybody's route to that destination is going to be the same. So um, my sister is seven years older than me. This is where the sort of probably cliche element comes in. She danced and did a bit bit of gymnastics. So like most boys, I guess, followed in her footsteps but I was inspired by her I could see there was something unique there and interesting that was appealing to me I was a very shy boy I would hide behind my mom's legs all the time I wouldn't make eye contact with people I wouldn't communicate really and then I asked them I said could I go to a dance lesson and neither of them questioned it they said okay great yep so they sent me off to this school that my sister had started to go to and and it was literally around the corner I grew up in the western suburbs of Sydney it's not the the glamorous image that people think of of Sydney you know people think of the Sydney Harbour or Bondi Beach Um, that was very much not my childhood it was an hour west Um, and yeah my parents couldn't give me the world financially but I felt like I had the world I had them I had their support and that to me was beyond crucial like here I was a seven-year-old boy in quite at the time it was a rough area of Sydney surrounded by traditionally you know very this is a male role that is a female role world you know it was the early 90s at the time 
and here I had two parents saying, "Great, go and go and dance. You know, you're the son of a drag racer. Go and dance. Wonderful. Like, stop talking about it. Just go and do it." And I can tell you now, I walked into that studio age seven, and I can feel it. I can, I can feel basically in my my skin what that felt like. That first lesson, you know, this very small, um, shy child went into the studio with these other kids. I think there was one other boy in the class, but obviously the rest were girls. And they all sort of knew the drill. They'd been doing it for a while. They knew the setup. It was a jazz class. And um, you know, this teacher put this loud music on and we were bouncing around. There was a big graffiti art display thing on the back wall, which I just thought was really cool. And um, before I knew it, she was just like screaming out, you know, jump as high as you can, spin as fast as you can. If you fall over, like, great, you'll get back up and you just try again and keep going. And I loved it. I absolutely loved it. And I, I describe it to people. It was like a, a tiger unleashed. I just felt this sensation before that I'd never experienced. And it was this complete freedom. It was something as a seven-year-old, like, of course, kids are, you know, I have three children. So I know that children are feeling free by jumping off a sofa or whatever. They think they can fly and all those sorts of things. Yeah, I was that kind of kid probably as well. But it was a different sensation. It was a different kind of freedom. I was, I was expressing myself in a way that I hadn't experienced yet at that age. And I was hooked, instantly hooked. Before I knew it, I said, I need to do more. So I was doing two days a week straight away basically within a few weeks I was going two days a week and then um I think it was by the age of nine I was dancing six days a week I was couldn't get enough <laughs> and 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 listening to you Stephen it's like you came from a family that uh, uh that pursued their passions and um and sort of uh were dedicated to you know drag racing and so you I'm, I'm assuming that you saw your parents put a lot of dedication and time into something and and I'm just wondering whether there's a relationship a relation between that and you putting time and dedication into your passion mm. and craft you know, I can very clearly hear my parents particularly my mum saying you, you can do whatever you want in life whatever you do you do what whatever it is but whatever you do do it well do it properly so if you want to be a bin man then you go and be the best bin man that you can possibly be if you want to be a lawyer you go and be the best lawyer that you can possibly be um you know i had this obsession with architecture as a teenager and i still do to be honest you know i i have many interests away from the world of dance which surprises a lot of people in the world of dance but that's I have these other interests and there was a period where I I thought that architecture was going to be my world that's what I was obsessed with you know I'm I, I'm quite you know analytical about things but I love the, the creative design element of things so at school I loved you know Latin and maths as well as the technical drawing and you know I yeah I was probably a geek to be honest but you know, that's who I was. I loved that element of things and the problem solving. But I think hearing your parents say that as well, like just doesn't matter what you do, but do it with passion, do it properly, like just throw yourself into it. Um, really has stuck with me forever, to be honest. And that's, I, I hear myself saying the same thing to my children, like even if it's just their homework or something I'm, I'm saying to them doesn't matter if you get it wrong or if it's not perfect or whatever but just like invest yourself in it give yourself to it like if it's you've got to concentrate for 20 minutes then just do that learn to concentrate for these 20 minutes and get it done um it's funny isn't it like you yeah. I guess as kids you fight against this concept of you becoming your parents in some way and it naturally happens. You 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 have elements that you you do hold on to. I think the good things, obviously, are the things that you you realize as an adult. You know what? My parents really did a great job. You know, with that element or that element. Yeah. So, yeah. 
Yeah, it sounds like if they said anything, you do anything you want, just go for it. It's an amazing, amazing start. But then, you know, um, in terms of a plan thereafter, <laughs> did you have one? Because it seems to be have been a pretty meteoric rise, you know, award winning, scholarship to the Royal Ballet School, you know, winning the Young Australian Achiever of the Year, becoming a principal dancer. You know, it seems like, you know, you were you were born to do it and it was all laid out in front of you, was it? <laughs> not at all. Absolutely not. So um, my parents, again, as, su as supportive as they always have been, they still, when I went to high school, they said, it's great that you love to dance. And they knew that it was something I needed to do. Um, but as a young teenager, I didn't know that you could dance professionally. I didn't know that was a thing because that was not my world. That's not what I was surrounded by. I didn't go to the theater. I didn't do any of that. Um, dance was just something I loved to do. So, and obviously this was all before the world of YouTube and Instagram and stuff like that. So you know, I wasn't watching videos. I wasn't exposed to that world scene that people do this for a living. So my parents were still very focused on my academics as in same attitude. You're at school, you put all the effort in. They'd never cared about my report card, what grade I got as, as in the actual mark, but it was always the effort and the comments from the teachers. That's what they focused on. You know, if, if there was a B for effort, they would question it and be like, what's going on there? Like, come on, <laughs> that's what's important to us. Um, so yeah, I guess it wasn't until I met this teacher in Sydney. So my early teachers, I now know were some of the best teachers anybody could ever have, particularly for those foundation years. But they took me to a certain point and remarkably, they said, we've taken you as far as we think we can take you. It's time for you to go to somebody else, which is the most extraordinary quality of a teacher to acknowledge what it is that they've done, but it's time to move on. And so this teacher, Hilary Kaplan in Sydney, I met her about age 13. And she said to my parents, oh, your son will go to the Royal Ballet. None of us knew what that was. I thought it was in Melbourne or something. I'd, <laughs> I had no concept of what she was talking about. And uh, anyway, so I just started to go to her weekly and do lessons and things. And then about the age of 15, she said to my parents, like, this is getting serious now, you know, it's time for us to put a video together and we'll send it over to the Royal Ballet School and see if they can offer him a place and things like that. So it was about the age of 16 then that the school said, yeah, we're interested in him. Um, they had no scholarships or anything at the time. That was obviously an absolute no-go then for my family. Like at the time it was uh, one pound was three Australian dollars. So there was not a chance in hell <laughs> that I was going to London to live at one, you know, and, and train at one of the most expensive schools in the world. Um, so then my teacher said, right, there's this competition in Switzerland, Pre de Lausanne. And many big stars in the dance world have started off there. And the, the competition is about connecting, you know, young students, young talent to the best schools and even companies in the dance world. So I luckily won a competition in Australia a few months before it. So that prize money funded my flight to Switzerland. I turn up in Switzerland with my mom. We'd never been to Europe before. It was 40 degrees in Sydney when I left and it was snowing in Lausanne. Um, the whole competition, they spoke in French, so I had no concept what was going on. I was just, I didn't grow up around any foreign languages. The stage was raked, which means it's angled. And I just, again, was so uneducated in the world of theater that I didn't even know that was a thing. I didn't know that why on earth is a floor <laughs> at an angle? Like, why would you do that? Um, so here I was in this completely foreign, obscure setting, totally out of my depth, not having a clue what was going on. Um, and my mum and I were just there by ourselves and I did the competition and I don't know how, <laughs> but at the end of the competition, they were announcing the results and I was ranked first. So I got the first choice of where I wanted to go. And the director of the Royal Ballet School was head of the jury. And um, I said, well, of course, I would love to go to the Royal Ballet School. This was January, February time. So it's halfway through the academic year. And she said, well, I know roughly your 
family situation. So she said, don't waste money flying all the way back to Australia tomorrow to come back in the September time. She said, uh, just change your flight and tomorrow, um, instead of connecting in London to go home, you just get off in London and that's it. You'll start at the school. Oh, so I won. Oh my goodness. I, I, mean, yeah, that, yeah. I won the competition Sunday evening and Monday morning, my mum and I flew to London. Um, and then Tuesday morning, she left and went back to Australia. And I was there in London. I'd just turned 17, had nowhere to live. The school facilities were full because it was halfway through an academic year. Um, so I ended up living in a hostel for the first six months. Um, and I struggled. It was horrible. You know, I was this 17 year old kid who had just won this competition that I'd never even dreamt that I'd be able to win the competition, but I won it and got essentially what I was there to do, a scholarship to the school I wanted to go to. And I was miserable. I, I just, I hated it. I just thought this is not how I'm meant to feel at this stage, you know? And obviously when I arrived at the school, everybody assumed that I would be this really cocky, arrogant, confident person. Like here he is, he's just one, he's gonna think he's this and that. And it was the complete opposite. I was so vulnerable and, you know, I just cried every day basically for weeks and um, was lucky to have obviously met good friends um, in my year that, you know, really helped support me and navigate the way through. Um, but yeah, it was just, I guess, being shot out of a cannon. It was all of a sudden, oh, this yeah. was something we talked about and let's see, it might happen to, oh, I'm now on the other side of the world alone, age 17. I have to open a bank account. I, I have to eat. I have to do laundry. I have, what? Like it was, yeah, sink or swim, to be honest. But then those moments make you genuinely look so deep inside and say, how much do I want this? You know, is it worth it? And that's something I have had to sort of question myself and ask a lot throughout my entire career, to be honest, because when we were in Switzerland, my mom, bless her, the pressure that was on my parents was insane because they knew that if I didn't get a prize, they couldn't fund this particular chapter of the journey. I know there are multiple ways around it, but it it, put, it just put so much pressure on them that my mum actually had to have some medical attention while we were in Switzerland. And, you know, still to this day, I think she's still on the same medication because that was it. Like overnight, her son was living on the other side yeah. of the world. And of yeah. course, your par like parents want the best for their children and want them to pursue their dreams. But there was no, I guess there was just no preparation for it. There was no warning or, yeah. you know, it was such a sudden dramatic shift. And the reality is I've not lived in Australia ever since, you know, I've never since, lived yeah. home since that, since that day. So. So, so, so it, 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 it was a sort of meteoric rise, wasn't it? Like you say, sort of shot out of the cannonball. And I noticed that you say things like, well, luckily I won and I, I just happened to become first. And um, so is there, you know, what, what was there a lot of the people that I work with, you know, say that they suffer from imposter syndrome. <laughs> is there such a thing when you are being, when you're winning prizes in Switzerland and, 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 uh, you know, being given a place at the Royal Ballet School? Do you, did that happen to oh, you? Oh, definitely. So this will paint a picture for you to show you that I had really no concept of what I was getting involved with and just had no exposure to the world that I was entering. Um, the day I arrived at the school, so literally after the competition, the, the Royal Ballet Company across the road in the Opera House were putting together Sleeping Beauty. And they always use students in the productions as extras. So uh, they needed, there's a particular scene. It's a hunt scene in the forest. And they have some students literally holding a tray of cups, you know, for the court to arrive and stuff. So they sent me across the road with the students and said, like, you're going to be involved in Sleeping Beauty. And so I'm sat at the back of this huge studio with the whole company. And um, they were doing act one and everybody got so excited because Darcy Bustle walked into the studio and 
they said, oh my God, Darcy's going to do the Rose Adage. And everybody was like, you know, sort of tripping out over it. They were buzzing around. And I was like, wow, what, what, what's going on? And Darcy was a name that I actually did know. I had heard of her. But they were all like, the Rose Adage, the Rose Adage. I had no concept what they were going on about. But, and for, <laughs> so for your listeners, the Rose Adage in The Sleeping Beauty is basically Aurora has her 16th birthday and she has to choose a prince to marry. Um, and she has to do this dance with the four different princes. And it's probably the most stressful and difficult thing a ballerina ever has to do. She stands literally on her toes and takes the hand of a prince and then has to let go on one leg whilst that prince walks away and another prince walks in and she takes the hand. But it's it's quite a spectacle. It's, it's a, an incredible thing to watch on the Opera House stage. And um, I literally turned to the people around me and said, sorry, but what's the rose adage? And uh, <laughs> they, I, I just think they thought I was trying to be funny or a comedian, but I genuinely had no concept of what it was that I was watching or being, you know, about to be involved in. Um, and then, yeah, I, my head was blown from that. I just was bowled over and I thought, wow, I'm okay. This is something extra here. Yeah. And but when did you realize? So you were obviously a fish out of water yeah. in that 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 world. You and, and you got like literally, as you say, shot out of a cannon into it. But when did you realize that actually I'm pretty good at this and that the hype around me is true? Or are you? I, I'm I'm just detecting huge amounts of modesty, and I don't know whether that comes from being Australian or 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 what. I don't think I've ever had that moment of oh, yeah, okay. I've got this. I don't think I've ever got that. I think I, I've i built up a huge amount of self-trust over the years. You know, when you're going out onto that stage and, you know, you've got 2,500 people watching you every night or it's being relayed to cinemas globally with God knows how many people watching you and with this day and age as well, everybody records everything. So what you do, it's there for life and people will judge you on that for the rest of your life, even if it is a bad show. Um, I've had to learn that, yeah, okay, you can be as harsh a critic on yourself as you want, um, but you have to have that moment where you have faith in the work that you've put in to get you to that point. Um, there's always going to be something better. There's always something that could have been executed better or whatever it is in life. But I had to, I guess, stop trying to chase this idea of perfection and rather acknowledge this is how I'm feeling right now. I've done all that work up to this point. I'm obviously going to do the best I possibly can right here, right now. And accept that, okay, there might be things that I'm not happy with, but it's still enough. It's still good enough. And I think that's a different quality. Having self-trust and self-belief is different to thinking that you're good. <laughs> yes. Yes. I think that's such an important important thing I think because a lot of perfectionists and I presume you are you know that um in in the dance world you, you, you there's lots of perfectionism it can often be a miserable thing well, because dangerous. there's always one act. Yeah. yeah it's a dangerous yeah. quality perfectionism and you can very quickly begin to live a very miserable life because nothing will ever equate to what it is that you've got in your head you know so I I remember I would went through a period where I'd come off stage and every single performance, I would just write that performance off because this and this and this and this and this wasn't what I wanted it to be. And it's such a destructive, you know, cycle to get yourself into. And then, you know, things happen in life. Like I had an injury when I was much younger and that did help change my perspective on how I sort of speak to myself, <laughs> how I navigate those situations. But then you quickly get caught up in the cycle and, you know, the culture of the the, the industry again. And before I knew it, I was being so harsh and criticizing my every move that 
I was finding myself going into this bit of a spiral again. Um, but then I was fortunate to become a father, and that obviously helped put in a different perspective on things. But again, you then get caught into that cycle, and um, you end up, I guess, trying to live at this top level in everything you do. So I wanted to be the greatest father I possibly can. I wanted to be the best dancer I can possibly be. I want to create the best home for my family that I possibly can. And that can obviously be quite exhausting to have that sort of approach to life all the time. It's a great driver for motivation and things like that, but it's not realistic to live that way 24 hours of the day. <laughs> and um, But then, so how, but, but Stephen, how do you, what have been your techniques to cope with that those sort of um, that that inner critical narrative or that 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 you know how 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 have you how how do you do do you tackle that? Well, uh, two years ago, I snapped my Achilles on the Opera House stage in front of a full auditorium. Uh, there was no one else on stage; it was just me, um, and that literally has changed my life. I have worked a lot with psychologists and things to not to unpick my you know my overwhelming desire to be in control of everything and to try and achieve perfection and all this other stuff not to unpick it because that's a part of who I am but to acknowledge it and to to maybe start to have little markers or indicators of Ooh, you know what you you're sort of verging on the edge of you know crossing over here it's going too far um take a break or um you know, sometimes you do have to walk away from a situation and you know I was of the mentality particularly growing up you never walk away from a situation you finish it and you get it done and you know you just you suck it up and you dig your heels in and you you achieve it but that's not realistic. That's not reality. Sometimes you do actually need to walk away from a situation, have a moment, reassess, come back to it. And I've learned that purely because, you know, my Achilles was reconstructed. I had to learn how to walk again. And the reality was things that I probably used to do, I could no longer do. And I had to, you know, navigate a way around that. And my idea of I think um, self worth uh, was was challenged. You know, in my profession, of course, like any athlete, the minute you are injured, your your self worth, the value you give yourself, plummets. Your stocks go <laughs> in value. You you see yourself as of no value. You see yourself as useless, um, and that is such a destructive world to be part of. And that that mentality is a very destructive mentality. And I've had very good discussion about this with one of my close friends, and he's a colleague, um, a dancer in the company, and he, he and I were saying, like, it, it needs to change. You need to remember that your self-value, your self-worth has been accumulated over your whole life. Just because this one moment you're injured and you, okay, maybe you're out of action, your value does not change. You're still the same person. Everything you've accumulated is still there. This injury process, if anything, is only just going to add more value to you. But we don't see that because if you're not there on the center of the stage doing your what is your normal job, um, then you think that you're, you're useless and worthless. So the injury that I've been going through um, has made me reassess that and actually give more value to other elements of my life that are just as important as me standing in the middle of the stage. Yeah, it's, oh, Stephen, it's so, you, it's so beautifully put, you know, it's this, the difference between between having all your validation sort of externally validated in, in the kind of, in the outward manifestation of who you are yeah. and, or, or have being internally validated where, you know, you are many things and, your your dance performances and dance career is just one of those many things. Yeah. So it's be beautifully, beautifully put. 
Um, and uh, what I what I noticed actually is that you 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 said you didn't go to you presume you were at, you were uh, at the Royal Ballet School when most other people may well have been doing further education. But I noticed that you do have a BA honors degree in business management and leadership. Um, and I was just curious to know that in your role as principal dancer, does that mean you are a leader? Do you use those leadership qualities? What's your attitude to leading? Well, so going back to my academic education. I hate saying academic education because I think education is just education, whether it's academics, arts, whatever it is. But, you know, society, unfortunately, still likes to label everything. My academic education um, actually finished in this country. It would be the equivalent of GCSE level, because when I arrived mm -hmm. here, it was different academic year because Australia and Europe, they have different academic year. So it didn't work for me to get involved in A-levels because I'd missed a chunk of their time. Um, so I was lucky that my teacher in Sydney and her business partner, very much passionate about dance, but very open about re-educating themselves about multiple things in life. So they were, you know, adults who were constantly doing a new degree in this or that or a course in this or that. And I just, I guess, saw that actually life is education. You're constantly learning. You don't need to do it in a particular order. So when I was in the company, Royal Ballet Company, I suddenly was thinking, you know, obviously I'm passionate about this profession. I want to be involved in this profession in multiple ways, even if I'm not stood in the center of the stage. And I was obviously becoming more aware that it's not enough just to have an artistic vision anymore, you know. You've got to have the artistic vision, but you've also got to understand, you know, the finances or the marketing or whatever it is that's going on behind the multiple elements that go behind every organization. And so I, I spoke to our company manager at the time, who is actually now our artistic director. And I said to him, I, I'm thinking of doing some additional study. So I contacted the Open University and they accepted me. And I so I did this business management and leadership degree it took me forever because I was obviously I was doing it part-time whilst performing like a lunatic and um, I absolutely loved it because again it just opened my eyes to just different ways of thinking and um, even with my own position in the company looking at my director at the time and thinking oh I would normally have really got annoyed at her decision there but when I look at multiple elements behind the scenes that probably influence that decision, it actually makes a bit more sense. So I was able to process my own existence a little bit better. Um, but then a few years ago, I thought, actually, I'm ready to just do some more study. And um, I've always loved you know, advertising and the concept of marketing in general. So I contacted the University of Exeter and said, can I do... A master's degree in marketing and um, they I think were fascinated like why is this dancer <laughs> wanting to do a marketing degree um, but again that is my industry it's all about marketing is all about understanding your audience it really isn't it and that's what theatre is theatre is understanding who is your audience what is it that they want to see how do they want to be challenged how can I also challenge them and I loved it. I absolutely loved doing that master's degree. It was, um, you know, University of Exeter were absolutely brilliant. I have to say I did it online with them and the, the setup that they did was was incredible. Um, but it was a it was a great opportunity for me to really enjoy the artistic creative side that I've obviously spent my career in with that analytical more, you know, tactical mind that I also enjoy. So um, I intend to utilize all of those additional studies within my industry, but also with the idea that maybe I want to embark on other industries in time as well, taking all of my experience of dance and the arts into those other industries, because, you know, everything does cross over and intermingle and each industry can influence another industry and when you bring some of them together in unusual ways great things happen 
Yeah, and absolutely. You know, one of the things that I work with a lot of people with people is like set, how to sell yourself fearlessly. <laughs> you know, and um, and I, you know, I'm often saying you have to be your own agent. You have to you have to market yourself. Yeah. So, and you you've worked in such an incredibly competitive industry. You know, what is your philosophy in terms of selling yourself and you know putting yourself out there? Um, I think embracing just the fact that you are unique you know i i'm not ever trying to be like somebody else i'm not trying to replicate somebody else's career or um, when i step on stage i'm not trying to do a role like somebody else or how the original person who it was created for did it um, even the way i live my life like you still get those funny <laughs> responses from other parents at the school gate when they say oh so what do you do and then you say oh i'm a dancer with royal ballet some of them don't know how to respond to that. They don't know how to react. And I think, come on, people, it's 2022. Like, yes, I'm a man who dances. Are we still, <laughs> you know, are we still having that conversation? Um, so I, I, I guess I've just embraced that, yeah, I have a very different life to probably what most people see as the typical life. But that's who I am. I've never sort of been ashamed or um, I've never tried to apologize for being who I am you know I remember arriving <laughs> into the UK and my first few years in the company I can remember some people in management asking me particularly when I had to do interviews please can you just not be so Australian and it used to <laughs> kill me because I thought god like that's who I am like I you know I think ambition used to be sort of frowned upon it used to be like uh, a bit of a dirty word like if you showed that you were very ambitious it was almost vulgar um, thankfully I think that has really changed in society now I think the London Olympics had such a huge impact here in the UK you know it inspired people these athletes that you know they were not ashamed of it they were this is what I want this is what I want to achieve and I'm going to do it and I think that's been um, something that I've tried to live by. I'm not putting it out there that this is my goal and this is what I want to achieve to be competing with other people. It's purely competing with myself. I'm saying that because this is the challenge I'm setting myself. If I don't achieve it, it doesn't affect any of you. I'm just saying this is what I would love to do. And um, you know, I, I'm, I, I guess I'm a, a goal-orientated kind of person. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, yeah, it, I mean, and I, I saw that you'd, you'd written or you'd been quoted as saying, I find it incredibly disheartening that so many people on the planet can't truly live the lives that they want to mm -hmm. live. So what? just expand on that. Well, I, I still get messages a lot from parents who, you know, say, oh, I have a son who's very talented, but, you know, he's still struggling at school, you know, with bullies and all that sort of stuff because he's a dancer why are we still having these problems? It's so sad. It makes me, you know, so angry. And, you know, even my own children, they are being brought up where, yeah, I hope they believe that they can do absolutely anything in life. It doesn't matter what background you've got or, you know, anything. Um, they still, I see them being influenced by friends and people like that, that, Oh, hello. <laughs> we have a guest. Hello. <laughs> There's one of them. Hello. <laughs> that was Rupert, our youngest one. <laughs> so cute. And yeah, I, they stick. I see these children who are still coming up against society and being questioned about what it is that they're passionate about. And if there's a young boy who wants to dance and is passionate about it, nobody in the world has the right to question that young child's passion. That's what's giving them a spark in life. Um, that should be celebrated. And I, I just get so angry at the thought that there are still people out there who have to question something like that. It's no one's business. If that young person is passionate about that or if that adult is passionate about that why are we questioning it that's that's making them happy let them go and live their life 
Yeah. So you're talking, are you talking about like still stereotype? The stereotype is that, oh, you know, uh, a little boy shouldn't be interested in dancing Definitely. and a little girl should Definitely. be. Yeah. And, yeah, and yeah, that, yeah. that still needs to be worked on within our own industry. You know, the, if you go to a, a small dance school, it's literally just full of little girls all dressed in pink twirling around to you know plinky plonky music pretending they've got a wand in their hand why would any boy want to go to that and if a boy does go there of course his friends are going to think well why on earth are you doing that that's not right um so our own industry has to change the way that we are attracting you know students to dance and also the image that we're putting out there dance is for everybody dance is for like every single human on the planet has this natural instinct within them to move a certain way. It's it's like primal. It's like hearing music. It naturally makes you want to just bop around. And dance literally is for everybody. It should be appealing and attractive to everybody and not just the typical scene of, you know, six-year-old girls dressed in pink going to the local hall. Yeah, and I mean, when you look at the 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 strength and power and and athleticism and the dedication, I mean, it, I you know, why is it not an Olympic sport? <laughs> I mean, you have rhythmic gymnastics, don't you? But I mean, it just the incredible physicality and dedication. I mean, it's just mind boggling. Yeah, I mean, the physical side of it, you know, the mental side, we could talk about for <laughs> days on this podcast. Uh, yeah. But the physical side of it. Um, is something I also have a little bit of an issue with because the world of sport has moved on so much. You know, they have invested so much research and attention into looking after athletes physically, um, knowing how to push them, but how to let them recover, how to get the best performance out of an athlete when they need to peak and so on. Professional dancers, particularly those who work in companies like the Royal Ballet, we work six days a week. Sometimes you're on your feet for nearly 12 hours and you are in peak condition for the entire season, which for the Royal Ballet, that is basically 11 months of the year. We, we, you, know, you have a four week break in the summer, but the rest of the time you're in peak condition. The world of sport shakes their head at that because that's impossible. That's impossible to be in peak condition all year round, six days a week. That's just the end. Like, that's just not possible. And the dance world is still not taking their, you know, blindfolds off and accepting that actually we need to change the way that, you know, the workload is is put onto the performers. Um, and that's something that I've I've really had to re-educate myself over the last few years with my my Achilles injury. And it's highlighted to me just what an unhealthy and dangerous lifestyle I was living before all of my Achilles troubles started. You know, I was basically malnutritioned. I, I was not um, fueling myself in the way that was enabling my body to function. You know, I was in a negative state of energy for years and years and years and years. And God knows what that was doing to my overall health. Um, and if I hadn't, had this injury god knows what that was going to do long term to my health as well so i've had to obviously go on this huge um, discovery myself guided by the medical team that i'm now working with thank goodness for them that i've been able to learn so much through them but it's now my mission to use what i've learned and put it back into my profession so that the profession continues to evolve i love my profession it's an incredible life um, and dance can literally transform people's lives, whether you're the dancer or you're the audience, you know, it's, it is so powerful, but there are things that fundamentally have to change and that has to start by putting the dancer at the forefront and center of every discussion. Is this right for the dancer? Not, is it right for the theater? You're creating a film, you're making a film called A Resilient Man, I think is the working title. So tell me about that. Yeah, so I met an incredible filmmaker, Stefan Carell, uh, a few years ago, and he contacted me wanting to explore some particular ideas with me. 
Um, and then, ironically, I snapped my Achilles. And I think we both just saw it as a great opportunity to obviously use that as a bit of a focus of the, the, the film. But as my journey has evolved, it's also highlighted that, that there is so much to talk about. Um, so the film obviously will show the difficulty of snapping your Achilles, um, what that does to you mentally, physically, the journey that, you know, that is involved with something like that. The reality is if I was a footballer, I would have been back on the pitch a year earlier than what I was to get back on stage. That's just the reality. Physically, what's required for a dancer is unfortunately like combining multiple Olympic sports into one thing. So it takes so much longer, the, you know, the tiny finesse and detail of what is required of our bodies. So I um, am using this documentary to inspire people. I don't want it to be just about dance. I want people from all walks of life to, to feel an impact of this story. You know, most people, when I snapped my Achilles, sort of wiped their hands and said, that's sort of the end then of his career. Um, surely that's it. He's not going to come back from this. Well, I got back. <laughs> I did it. And I came back and did probably the most demanding male role you're ever going to do as my first show back. And I want people to be motivated by that. You know, find, find a way of connecting with that story. You know, finding and realizing that this is the destination that he's trying to get to multiple roads there are literally blockages but he's found a way he's found a route to get there uh, I'm still finding a route to get there because once you're back on stage it's very different staying on stage to just doing that one show back but the film is there to motivate people it's um, I guess a story of hope for many people as well um, there's a huge athletic side to the film so it's not just oh this is a niche film for the dance world it's very much in the realm of sport mental health um but then again as i said i will also use it to try and spark the discussion um, within my own industry to make those positive changes i'm not standing pointing fingers saying this and that and this and that was wrong i'm just saying like everything in life we have to learn and evolve and move forward and that's my hope of the film so we're just in the stages of trying to, you know, obviously raise funds and get the interest involved. But um, the film will be a beautiful film. I, I want it to be a piece of art itself, not just, a, you know, talking to the camera kind of documentary. Yeah. And, and what do you think, you know, I mean, it's, it, it sounds brilliant, brilliant and uh, I think so inspiring. And what, what would you say the greatest... Um, lessons that you've learned are about about making it back you know about having that resilience about you know what, what is that secret source you know I've always had this inner competitiveness with myself that you know I've whether it was trying to get the highest mark I could possibly get in a maths exam or you know trying to execute a, a solo at a competition the best I possibly could. I've always had that within me, naturally competitive mm -hmm. with myself, not necessarily competitive with others around me. But when my Achilles had snapped and I had the surgery and the place that it snapped was even more intricate and delicate, it was right next to the bone. So it's reinforced and I've got bungee straps on there and it's drilled into my bone and it's all, it's bionic basically. Um, I had to navigate this new leg, this new limb. It was not the limb that I've grown up with and learnt my whole craft with. Um, it's this new leg. It was not functioning in any way like I was used to. I had to learn how to walk again. And there were genuine moments that, yeah, of course, I would sit there and just think, what am I doing? What am I doing? This is insane. But then I have these three little people in my life that they just want their dad. They don't care if he's flying around on the stage or 
you know, can lift that amount in the gym or, you know, can throw that ballerina that high in the sky. They just want their dad. They want to, they want to go for a walk to the playground. They want to go for a drive to the, you know, to Richmond Park. They want to have a fun, like, on the green kicking a ball that's what they want they just want their dad to laugh and joke around and you know pick them up and that genuinely was my focus throughout the initial rehab i wanted to be able to function just as dad <laughs> and i kept just relaying that to my medical team when i would like hit certain targets when you're being tested in the gym with all this equipment and stuff and they would be getting excited, saying, great, you've made this progress and that progress. And I'd say, yes, but I still can't walk to the playground. That's the focus. Okay, great. Put a perspective on it again. And I'd reach another target. Okay, that's great. But I still can't kick a ball. Um, and that was my constant focus. And that, I think, helped. It just helped keep a real perspective on what it is that I was trying to do. Realistically, the mountain was huge i literally i've described it that i felt like i was stood naked at the bottom of everest and then just told off you go you need to get to the top and when you feel that overwhelmed and swamped by a situation i've had to learn right let's break it down i need to compartmentalize here and right if i just look at that i'm just going to sit and cry and never <laughs> <laughs> never even t take that first step but by having my children as the focus that was really the driving factor behind it all that's what every day you know I was doing my rehab via zoom during lockdown and that was torture to be honest it was just so cruel you know I was here doing <laughs> trying to recover from this injury and I had I think about four weeks of treatment at the opera house before the world went into lockdown and again, I would just say every morning, right, I'm doing this so that I can, you know, in a few months time, hopefully walk to the playground or hopefully kick a ball or, you know, do those things. So I'm not saying every morning I was smiling, turning the Zoom on to do these exercises via Zoom. <laughs> um, you know, some days I just literally cried whilst doing it. But they were and still are to this day my my focus now my focus has shifted it's a very selfish profession the industry i'm in you have to be you know you're constantly looking in the mirror trying to improve on yourself everything's about yourself 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 and the children take all that away because when you're a parent it's not about you anymore <laughs> it's purely um you know for me at least it's very much about them so it it really helped just find a bit of a healthy balance there wonderful and and um how do you measure success um yeah that's <laughs> that's such a, a big question isn't it because i think my concept of success has obviously evolved over my journey and i know it will continue to evolve as my life continues going back to the beginning when I went to the Prix de Lausanne months before that competition, if you'd asked me that question, I would have said, well, success is me winning the competition so that I can go to the Royal Ballet School. But then of course I joined the school and the next focus was, well, now you've got to get a job with the company. There's no point just being in the school. You now want to go to the company. And then of course that just, that goal kept shifting and I wanted to be a principal and then I wanted to dance this role and I wanted to dance with that ballerina and all those sorts of things so that all sort of got thrown out the window when I became a father again because for me it's okay are they healthy do they seem happy that to me is probably more of a gauge of success for me right now um but it's all relative, isn't it? Because when I'm stood on that stage, my idea of success is giving the audience a night that, you know, hits them and makes them walk away from the, th the theatre feeling that I've added something to their life in some way. Um, that's my idea of success there. So I can't put a definition on what I, I think success is because 
you know, cooking a nice meal, you know, if I don't ruin a steak when I'm cooking it, that's a success to me. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, and my final question is, you know, what are you, what are what are either your golden rules or do you have a motto that you live by? Um, I really do try and live by what my parents said to me at a young age. Just whatever you're doing, just do it properly. Do it the best you possibly can. So um, I'm, I, I hear myself relaying that to my own children already. Um, my wife's uh, great-grandfather lived till he was you know, 99. And his philosophy with his health was just, oh, I have everything, but just in moderation. And I also love that philosophy as well, because particularly in my industry, you can become so focused and tunnel visioned about what it is you're trying to do that you start to control every element of your life. You know, I must sleep this amount of hours and I must eat this food at this hour and I must do this, 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 this. And you become so chained to this way of life that actually sometimes you just need to sit down and have a glass of wine because that's going to make you feel good in other ways. Yeah, physically, is that the best thing for you to do? Probably not. But all the other elements that it will do and make you feel good are probably going to outweigh the slight negative impact that glass of wine will have on you physically. And that's only recently that I've learned that. and. Um, so I think that philosophy of everything in moderation is actually a healthy approach to life. Yeah, wonderful. Well, listen, Stephen, that that about wraps it up for me. I, I can assure you that your podcast or your interview has hit, hit us here and we are walking away uh, the richer for it. So you have definitely all your, your philosophy, sharing your experiences, your your struggles, your your overcoming of obstacles has has been so powerful and so inspiring. So I want to say thank you so much. And um, we are going to follow your journey all the way, wherever it takes <laughs> you. And uh, um, just very, very truly thankful for your time. My pleasure. Thank you for having me.